Before I get started with today's message, I just want to give you a heads up on what's coming up at Hope this fall because I have never been more excited about an upcoming season of our church than I am about what's coming up at Hope this fall. So let me give you a quick overview of what you can expect. Next Sunday, we're starting a new series. It's called Heroes. And the idea of this series is what we see on the big screen today for heroes is you have to have supernatural ability. And that's a stretch for some of us. I mean, I can, I'm lucky if I get both my shoes tied correctly and they don't come untied before lunchtime. Uh, But what we're going to discover is that it's ordinary people who have courage that are the people who actually change the world in real life. So we're going to be talking about that. And the reason why I'm excited for that series is because I'm not going to be the only teacher during that series. Uh, See, uh, in the last year or so, I've been able to join a couple of networks of like-minded pastors, uh, both locally and nationally, who are committed to multiplying the church and people who aren't concerned with here's my little c church and i'm protective of it but hey it's all about the big c church of jesus and we want to multiply that and we're actually going to have some of those pastors uh, helping me teach that series Uh, so that's going to be four weeks long starting next sunday then in september we have a brand new series called brand new so that's pretty clever huh and we and, and and here's who this is really for i don't want you to miss this if you are interested in being baptized, or if you have questions about baptism, or you have someone you know in your life or in your family, and they're asking about baptism, you do not want to miss this series. And as part of it, we are going to have an incredible special event centering around baptism, and it's going to be so cool. I'm looking forward to that. And then, finally, on Sunday, October 14th, you can go ahead and mark your calendars. I will not be offended if you get your phone out right now and mark your calendar for Sunday, October 14th. We are beginning the most important message series that I have ever preached in my nine plus years as Hope's pastor. Uh, We're going to spend five weeks talking about the next season of hope, uh, what's coming up, uh, how we're going to launch to our next stage of impact as a church. Uh, So that's coming up Sunday, October 14th, and I'm so excited for that one. I kind of wish that today was already October 14th. Uh, No intention of throwing shade on the last part of our series, Shadows. Anyway. That's all I got. That's all I got today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, But today we are wrapping up our our series, Shadows, and if you've missed it, we've spent most of the summer talking about the life of a very important historical figure, a man by the name of Moses. And uh, he's so important biblically, he, his life covers four books of the Bible. Uh, he's so important historically, Jews and Christians both uh, look to him as a forefather of their faith. Uh, but he was important just in his own generation. He uh, liberated, he gave uh, social and economic freedom to an entire uh, ethnic group of people. Some two million Hebrews were in slavery in Egypt, and he liberated them and led them out and established them in a brand new land. And so today, uh, we're wrapping up his story. It's not the end of his life story, by the way. You you cannot possibly cover the life of a historical figure this significant in only eight weeks. Uh, I've been carefully selecting which parts of his life story we're looking at. Uh, So today, the reason why I picked this event from the life of Moses is because he talks about something and addresses a problem that really is rampant in our culture today. In fact, this is something that I believe impacts and touches all of us, and because it's such a universal thing in America and in the Western world, I wanted to make sure we hit this story, because today, we're going to learn about discontentment. Now, don't raise your hand on this one, but how many of you in the room would say, you know what? I am totally content with my life. When I look at my job, I'm satisfied. When I look at my paycheck, I'm satisfied. When I look at my car, I'm content. When I look at my phone, I'm content. When I look at my TV, I'm content. When I look at my bank statements, I'm content. When I look around at everything I have, you know what? I could not be more satisfied. I am so content with what I have. Probably not too many of us could make that statement. And the problem or the struggle with that is we've all learned by experience that it's a pretty lousy feeling to have something that you worked for and you earned money for and you paid for and it doesn't even bring you satisfaction. And you feel like you have to go back to work and work more and earn more more money to get something that you hope will finally 
give you satisfaction. Now, we live in a culture that absolutely promotes discontentment. And this has changed over the years. Think about it. Several years ago, it was expected that if you wanted to buy something, you had to have cash in your hand before you could actually buy the thing. Isn't that crazy? You had to have money before you could bring it home with you. And if you didn't have money before you could bring it home with you, they would say, no problem. You can go to Sears and you could say, I want that washer and dryer set, but I don't have the money to pay for it. But I really want to get this 20% off deal. They would say, no problem, here's what we'll do. We will take this washer and dryer that you want, we will put it in our warehouse, and we will slap your name on it, and we will set up affordable monthly payments for you, and when you have paid off all your monthly payments, you can come pick up your new washer and dryer and take it home with you after you've paid for it. Now, do you know what we used to call that program? It was this program called, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Le Awai, Le... I've seen it in print, but I've never heard anyone say it. How do you, how do you say it? L layaway. That's it. Thank you. Layaway. That's what we used to call that. Do you know what we call that today? We call that stupid. Why would you do that? Why would you pay for it before you take it home? You can just plunk down your credit card and you can take that home today and get that 20% off deal and off you go. But now there's a problem. If you don't pay off your credit card by the end of the month, that 20% off, guess what? It just got tagged right back on, and now you're paying full price, and if you miss next month's payment, then you pay a bonus 20% on top of that. Why would we do that? Why would anybody do that? Or let's say you're shopping for a new car, and you've read all the magazines, and you've read all the, the blue book places online, and, and you figured out this is the best car for me, this is the one that gets the best reviews, and this is how much it costs, and this is what people are paying for it, and you're ready, and you go in, and you negotiate down, and your goal is, I'm going to get this car for $20,000. And the salesman says, well, would you pay twenty six dollars for it? And you say, absolutely. Would you do that? Apparently, a lot of us do. Because once we take it home without having money for it, we finance it and we start making payments on it and we are willing to pay $26,000 for a $20,000 car that's worth $15,000 as soon as you drive it off the parking lot. Now, who would do that? People who struggle with contentment would do that. Now, this is an epidemic thing in our culture and we are all shaped by our culture on this one. Because one of the things that fuels discontentment in our lives is awareness. Awareness fuels discontentment. Have you ever been perfectly satisfied with something you owned until you found out there was a better one? Yesterday, your phone was great, but then you just found out there's a newer model with a bigger screen or a brighter screen or a faster processor, and all of a sudden, your phone that you were fine with yesterday is garbage today or with your TV, or your car, or whatever it is. And we live in a world, not only that is always producing something cooler, sleeker, slimmer, lighter, shinier, faster, we live in a world with an internet that puts that right in front of your eyeballs all the time. We are aware of the fact that there is newer, cooler, sleeker, slimmer, shinier than there was yesterday. And that awareness of what the possibilities are out there fuels our discontentment. And while that awareness fuels our discontentment, awareness doesn't cause your discontentment. Discontentment in your heart is caused by a spiritual poison that has crept into your life. So today, here's what we're going to do. If you're not content with your TV or your phone or your house or your clothes, I'm not going to beat you up for that today. I'm not even going to talk about that today. It's not what I'm interested in. I want to figure out how to help you see whether or not this poison has crept into your soul. And we want to deal with this at the heart level. We want to deal with this at the roots. Because it's a deeper problem of the soul that leads to discontentment on the surface. And as your pastor, what I want for you is a genuine satisfaction in life. 
It's, it's, it's miserable to be unsatisfied with life. It's miserable to not be content with what you have. And you want that for you too. You would love the feelings that come from being a content person. So today in the life of Moses, we're going to look at something that happened that launched people into discontentment and more importantly, how to deal with that poison that can infect our souls. Uh, to do that, we're going to be in Numbers chapter 21. This context is that Moses has already led the people out of Egypt. They have already crossed the Red Sea. They have already received the Ten Commandments. And now they are on their journey to the Promised Land. It's basically the borders of modern-day Israel. The Promised Land is the place where they were going to eventually settle, and they are wandering through the wilderness to get there. That's when we pick up our story. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. So they went to this country called Edom. They knocked on the door and said, hey, can we pass through? If our animals eat any food, we will pay for it. And the Edomites came out and said, nope, roads closed, time for a detour. So they go around uh, uh, this country of Edom, adding many miles onto their journey. Now, what happens is the people start reacting kind of like kids do on a summer family vacation road trip. And there's a detour and it's hot out. The kids start to get hangry, which makes dad pretty hangry too. That's kind of the, the, the setting here. But the people grew impatient on the way. <clears throat> They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. It's like mom's passing back the goldfish and they're just knocking the cup away. I don't want any goldfish. I'm tired of goldfish. I want Mountain Dew, not water. They just start complaining. Now, what was the miserable food they were complaining about? Here's what's fascinating. Since they were moving across a desert wilderness, there were not enough food supplies for that many people. There were some 2 million people. So God did something miraculous. Every morning when the people came out of their tents, they found that the ground was coated with food. And they didn't know what to call it, so they called it manna, which translated from Hebrew into English means, what is it? So they just had, what is it? You know, new breakfast cereal. So put your favorite cartoon character on, have a bowl of manna. Um, but, but we're told by Moses that it basically tasted like fresh baked honey biscuits. That's what I say. Hmm. I I wouldn't mind waking up every morning, go out on my front porch, grab the newspaper and some fresh baked honey biscuits. That sounds pretty okay. But after a while, they started complaining, we're tired of this, we want meat to eat. And God said, hey, no problem. He started started sending quail in in the evening. So they have meat in the evening, they have honey, fresh baked honey biscuits in the morning. They had food provided for them every single day. God provided breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we say, that sounds like a pretty good deal. But after a while, they started to grumble. They started to complain and saying, we detest this miserable food. What's going on? What's going on is that they have become, in their soul, infected with the poison that has been around for a very, very long time. In the beginning, the Genesis creation account tells us that God created Adam and Eve and He put them in a garden paradise. And when He put them in the garden paradise, He said, the whole place is yours. Eat anything you like. Enjoy it. It's all for you. There's one thing that belongs to me. It's the fruit of this tree. From this one tree, you cannot eat the fruit from this one tree. Everything else in the world is yours to eat. And in fact, the whole world is yours. Go explore it. Subdue it. Rule over it. Have fun. Have a great time. The entire planet is yours. The fruit of one tree belongs to me. And God did that. So that his perfect creation who saw his face could have one way they could show, I trust you, God. I love you, God. You before me, God. But a serpent slithered in to paradise. And the serpent whispered a lie. Are you really going to be content when that fruit is right in front of you? God is not giving you everything he could give you. God is not good. He's not giving you what you deserve. 
You deserve that fruit. Look how good it looks. Doesn't it look delicious? Doesn't it look great? He increased their awareness of the forbidden fruit they were not to eat. And when they believed the lie, the venom of the serpent entered their souls. And they no longer trusted that God loved them, that God had their interests at heart. And they were poisoned. Paradise itself was not good enough for them anymore. And ever since that time, that poison has existed and that poison has affected millions and billions of people throughout history. When a soul becomes infected with that poison, it doesn't matter what you put into it, nothing is going to satisfy it. At first, the marriage is wonderful. After a while, you're sick of him, you're sick of her. At first, the job is wonderful. After a while, you're complaining about it. At first, the car is amazing. After a while, it's just frustrating. And let me tell you who has learned this better than anyone. It's not those who have to go into debt to acquire more. It's those of us who are the most accomplished and successful and wealthy. Because you can just go out and upgrade. You can get the next best thing. And just like an addict gets a hit, it's a high from a new hit. When we acquire the new possession, we get that temporary rush of dopamine and it feels great, but it wears off. So you go out looking for the next high and acquiring the next thing. But it doesn't matter what you put inside that emptiness in your soul, it will not be satisfied. It happened in paradise. Paradise wasn't good enough for Adam and Eve anymore. It happened with the people following Moses in the wilderness, and it happens to us today. So here's what God did about their grumbling. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. Now, we look at that and say, well, that's a little extreme, don't you think? Isn't that like dad finally snapping, driving the minivan, pulling over, saying, all right, kids, I've had enough? Well, on the one hand, how do you get the attention of an entire nation of people so that they would turn around in their behavior and make them aware of the problem deep in their souls? But on the other hand, this is actually the most fitting thing possible that God could do. In English, it says that they were venomous snakes. The Hebrew word for venomous actually means fiery. They were fiery snakes. Now, venomous is obviously the right, Hebrew, the right English translation. But I think fiery is an important word because when someone was bitten by the snake and the venom, the poison entered their bloodstream, it was fire. It was a fire that could not be quenched. It was a fire that spread throughout their entire body and it was thirsty for more, but it could not be satisfied. That's exactly what was going on in their souls. They could not be satisfied with what they had. Which is why it was the perfect response from God. If you're taking notes, here's our first fill in the blank. The poison in their bodies mirrored the spiritual poison in their souls. And it got their attention. So here's what they did next. Verse 7. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. So the first thing they do, they go to Moses and they try and patch things up. Hey, a buddy. Uh, sorry about that whole grumbling thing against you. We were, we were out of line. Now, on the one hand, they had to do this because, as we've said throughout the series, Moses was a mediator. He represented the entire nation of people to a holy God, and they needed him to go to speak to God on their behalf. On the other hand, there's another spiritual principle that is at play here, and it is the importance of having and maintaining healthy friendships in the good times so that you have the right people around you in the bad times. In fact, uh, here's the fill in the blank. Spiritual healing often requires friends. 
There are seasons in our life where when we need spiritual healing, when we need help with our discontentment, when we need help just with the hardships of life, it will not happen unless we are surrounded by good people, unless we are surrounded by friends. The problem with having friends is friends are like owning a house. It takes a stupid amount of maintenance to keep your house up to where it needs to be. Friendships can be the same way sometimes. Sometimes they can annoy you. Sometimes they can frustrate you. And you're busy, you have work, maybe you're raising a family of your own. Who has time to maintain friendships? But when we walk away from our friends, especially our Christian friends, then we're all alone when we get to those seasons where we need people to walk with us spiritually, to help us when we are down, to correct us when we are out of line. People who love us and accept us just the way we are and love us so much, they're not going to let us stay the way that we are. They want the best for us. That's why at our church, we truly believe that your faith grows best in the context of healthy Christian friendships. That's why we designed a whole group system so that you can find your friends here in a growing church. Now, I love Sunday mornings. I get to stand on a stage, and this is kind of my moment to just, hey, this is what God has put on my heart this week as I've been reading the Bible. But this isn't the room where your faith grows best. Your faith grows best when you've got healthy Christian friendships where you can talk about these things on the personal level. That's why I want all of you to sign up for a group. In four weeks, we're going to start group signups for the year. We want you to get in a group. We want you to find your friends. We want you to connect with them. We want you to invest in those relationships because at some point we need them. And at some point they need you. Have you ever wondered why God led you to this church? Maybe you think you're here because you just like the Sunday morning experience and it's helpful for you. I think God brought you here not just so that You could like the Sunday morning experience and it would be helpful for you. He brought you here because you're part of the body of Christ. And he wants you to make a difference. He positioned you here to love and serve others and make a difference. So for four weeks, we're going to start group signups. Pick a group. Now, for some of you in the room, you love kind of slipping in here quietly and unseen and slipping out. And I get that. I totally understand that. That's what's comfortable. I want to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone and to take a step. If you've never been in a group before, your step is to join first group. And starting just a week and a half, uh, we have a brand new first group starting on Wednesday nights. It's only eight weeks long. And in first group, two things are going to happen. You're going to meet some new people, so you're going to have the opportunity to build some of those friendships. And you're going to learn how to leverage our church for your faith in God to grow bigger. It's going to be at our offices. I'm going to be there. And I want to challenge you to take that step. You can get more information at guest services on your way out. But the truth is, in our lives, spiritual healing often requires friends. But here's the second thing that we see in this that is definitely true. Spiritual healing requires the end of excuses. The people come to Moses and they say to Moses, we sinned. We're we're, we're going to stop blaming. We're going to stop saying life was better in Egypt. We're going to stop saying we're the victims. Hey, Moses, we sinned. We sinned against God. We sinned against you. And until you're ready to end the excuses, the poison of discontentment will continue in your souls. What excuses have you been making to justify your discontentment? Well, I work hard, so I deserve more. I'm worth it. I deserve that. I've put up with so much. I should have more. What what excuses need to end in your life if you're going to be healed from discontentment so you can get to the place where you are a person who is genuinely satisfied with what you have in life so you can enjoy what you have in life. So the people go to Moses, they apologize sincerely, and Moses goes to God and says, 
I'm, I'm going to pray for you guys. Let me go to God, and we'll see what God says about this. Here's what happens. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Now this is the weirdest solution anyone could possibly imagine. Okay, Moses, people are getting by poisonous snakes. Well, here's what I want you to do. Make a big bronze statue of a poisonous snake. And then put it on a big pole so that everyone in the camp can see it. So that when they're bitten by a snake, they can look at the statue of the snake and then they're going to live. This does not make any sense. First of all, it doesn't make any sense psychologically. How would that make the people feel every morning? They wake up, they walk out of their tents, grab some manna, look up. Ah, you know, there's that, there's that reminder of the very thing that's killing them. How would that give them any hope? How would that give them any optimism? doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense theologically. In their worldview, snakes were evil. I thought someone would give that an amen. Snakes are evil. They're scary, Right? And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Paradise. Snakes are evil. They were an unclean animal. It doesn't work psychologically. It doesn't work theologically. Why would God have Moses make a statue of a snake and put it on a pole? The truth is, I don't think they ever knew the answer. I don't think this ever made sense to them. But it does to us. And to figure out why, we have to look at something Jesus taught. So we're actually going to jump to the life of Jesus now. He lived 15 centuries after Moses. And one time in John chapter 3, Jesus was meeting with a man named Nicodemus, who was an important man, an official, a Pharisee. And when he was conversing with Nicodemus, Jesus gave the most famous quote he ever gave, probably the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But we're not going to look at John 3.16 today. We're going to look at the verse that came right before John 3.16. And do you know what verse came right before John 3.16? John 3.15, that's right. Some of you also must have gone to seminary and learned a lot of Bible that way. We're going to look at John 3.15 today because Jesus explains the significance of the snake and it is significant if we are going to be healed from discontentment. So I'm going to start with uh, John chapter 3, verse 1 to get the context for it. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So here we have this man named Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. Now, generally speaking, Pharisees did not like Jesus. But Nicodemus is a unique man. He's a member of the Jewish ruling council. Uh, that was the uh, Hebrew high court. So he's a smart man. He's a wise man. He's a powerful and influential man. He would have been born into a family of privilege, would have had a lot of money, would have been very esteemed by his people, and he was a Pharisee. Pharisees were very morally upright people. They were people you could trust. If you uh, had a neighbor who was a Pharisee, you'd probably be happy, except when you were drinking beers in the garage, then they would look at you funny. But other than that, they're good, honest people. Nicodemus was a good man, a religious man, an upright man, but at the same time, he wasn't an uptight bigot. He came to Jesus. Jesus, a man who had no education, didn't go through their schools, didn't rise up through the ranks, yet he calls them calls him rabbi, which shows a tremendous spirit of generosity towards Jesus. He approaches him respectfully. He wants to learn more about him. And he says, Jesus, listen, don't tell anyone I said this. And if you say I said this, I will deny we ever met. But we know. We know you're from God. Look, look at the, we see the miracles you're doing. We know you're from God. But our problem is you don't fit into the category of God that we have set up. See, the Pharisees thought they knew everything there was to know about God. And they had all their categories and all their doctrines and everything just right. And if God were ever to show up, if the Messiah were ever to show up, they knew exactly what he would do and they knew exactly what he wouldn't do. The problem with Jesus was he was clearly from God, but he did not fit any of their theological categories. 
Because if the Messiah came, he would be a good religious person like them. But instead, he seemed to attract all the wrong people, the irreligious people, the sinners, seemed to flock to Jesus, and he seemed to be attracted to them, not to the good people, not to the upright. And he said concerning things. He taught things like good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And the Pharisees thought, that's too easy. You have to be good or God isn't pleased with you. And so Jesus came in. He just kicked over all the boxes, but he's from God. So what do we do with Jesus? So Nicodemus comes to him at night to try and figure him out. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, this would have been so insulting to a Pharisee. Here's what he's saying. Everything you have done in your life up to this point doesn't mean anything before God. It's all worthless. All your goodness, all your morality, all your trying hard, worthless. You need a brand new life and a brand new identity if you want to see the kingdom of God. Nothing you've done matters. He continues, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. He's talking about baptism. You must be baptized and receive the new birth. We're going to talk about that in a couple of series. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. In other words, he's saying, cats have kittens, dogs have puppies, moms and dads have babies, but the Holy Spirit gives new life, spiritual life. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You know what that means? That means just like the wind is blown out of the east and then it shifts out of the south and people say, huh, never saw that coming. Oh, well. Jesus is saying, you're going to get to heaven someday and you're going to see some people there and your jaw is going to drop and you are going to say, you got in, and they're going to say right back, that's what I was going to say, okay? You can't, you can't see a lineup of 10 people and say, they're going to be a Christian, they're going to follow Jesus, they're going to follow Jesus, she's not, he's not, she's definitely not. You can't do that. The wind blows where it pleases, so does the Holy Spirit, and he gives new birth, new life to the most unsuspecting people. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, this is a different sermon for a different day, but Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. That's how he spoke of himself in the third person. He said, I'm the only one who's come from heaven, the Son of Man. He continues, just as, and he just drops this in out of nowhere as he's saying, you must be born again, you must be born again, or you'll never see the kingdom of God. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Hey, Nicodemus, remember when you were a boy growing up and you would go to the synagogue and they would read the book of Numbers and there's that one story of how the people complained and the venomous snakes came out and then Moses made the bronze snake and when they looked at it, they lived? Yeah. Did you ever understand it? No. Let me explain it for you. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Whoever believes, now the word believe doesn't just mean like I believe in the tooth fairy or the Easter bunny. Believe means believe into, lean into, trust into. Whoever leans on me, whoever looks to me for hope of healing, for hope of new life, has eternal life. You see, Nicodemus, here's the deal. The people were dead once they were bitten by snakes. They had no hope. Their life was forfeit. But when they looked to the pole and the snake on the pole, they were given new birth. They were given new life. Nicodemus, that was their point to me. 
when anyone looks to me, they are given new birth. They are given a new life. But again, how does that make any sense? Snakes represented evil. They represented sin. Jesus is the Son of God. He represents goodness and holiness. Why? why, How does that point to Jesus? Now, we have to look at one more verse in the Bible to bring all of this together. And the person who brought it all together was Jesus' own disciple, Peter. Peter was a brilliant Old Testament ninja. Like, he would take these verses that no one else would notice, and he would just connect all these dots, and all of a sudden, it all makes sense. It all comes together. He brings, like, these different ideas together together. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he's talking about Jesus and he says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he didn't become a sinner. He bore our sin, which means in God's presence, legally, Jesus became the sinner. Legally, in God's presence, Jesus became the serpent. Jesus became evil. Jesus became the one who was responsible for all the sin of the world. Peter says, he bore our sins in his body on the cross. He paid for them. He suffered for them. He died for them. So that result, we might die to sins and live. We might live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. In other words, Peter reiterates, when you look to Jesus, when you trust that what he did on the cross was for your sins, you're healed of the venom. You're healed of the poison. It's washed away. You're given new birth. You're given new life. You're given eternal life. Just like the Israelites who were bitten by the snakes, they got a new life when they looked to the bronze serpent. When we look to Jesus who bore our sins on the cross, we're given new life. And then Peter says something that finally connects all the dots, and he does it by paraphrasing Psalm 23. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Why does he tie in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 23? He says, here's why. Psalm 23 verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or depending on your translation, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. If God is your shepherd, if Christ is your shepherd, you lack nothing. And here's why. We become discontent if we think that the money of this world is the only wealth that we will ever have. But when we return to the shepherd, the overseer of our souls, we realize that there is true wealth stored up for you in heaven. We become discontent when we look in the mirror and we think that this is the only body that you will ever have. But when we return to the shepherd, the overseer of our souls, he reminds us, you will have a resurrected body in the kingdom of God. When you look around at your family and you think your family by blood is the only family you are ever going to have, when you return to the shepherd and overseer of your soul, you realize you have a family by the blood of Christ. And they will be your perfect family forever. When you look to Jesus and realize He is my shepherd, He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores your soul. He guides you in righteous paths for the sake of His own name. You lack nothing. You see, when we look to Jesus on the cross, not only do we get new life, but as we look to Jesus on the cross, we get healing of our souls healing of the poison of discontentment that is so easy to creep in living in the culture in which we live.
So if we put all this together, here's the bottom line. Spiritual healing, both new birth and healing from that poison of discontentment. Spiritual healing comes by looking, not doing. It comes by looking to Jesus, hanging on the cross, bearing our sins, giving new life. Now, got some homework for you to help you work this in to your life on a very practical level. Three things for you to think about this week. Number one, do you feel discontent? Now, you don't have to share this with anybody. You don't have to report back next week. But I think you owe it to yourself to be honest enough to not just feel a general discontentment, but to get real specific with what? What in your life are you discontent about? You should know that. You should own that. You should name that. Because the more honest you can get at that starting point, the more you'll be able to address the underlying problem. Second, what excuses do you make? Do you make excuses to justify your grumbling? Do you make excuses to justify your whining, your complaining? Do you feel entitled to something? Do you feel like you deserve something? Do you feel like you're better than something? What excuses do you make? Because spiritual healing doesn't come until the excuses end. So at least you owe it to yourself to know what excuses you make. And finally, what are you looking at? Are you looking to what you don't have? The car, the job, the paycheck, the bank statement, the vacation? Or are you looking at Jesus who was lifted up on the cross? Awareness drives your discontentment. But awareness of Jesus cures it. Return to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls, because in him you lack nothing. And that's where true satisfaction begins. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you that this deep truth is, is hidden right here in the Scriptures. Father, discontentment is so common in our generation, and we don't want to make excuses. It's common in our hearts, too, because it's, it's all around us. It's, it's normal. But to be discontent is, is to say, God, you're not good enough for us. God, we don't trust you. God, you're holding back from us. Help us to see it the way you see it, that, that we've been infected with a poison in our souls and we feel discontent. And then the cure for it is not to become stoic. It's to look to Jesus. Jesus, you were lifted up. You bore our sin. You give us new life. And you have such a future for us. Let that be our joy. Let that be our satisfaction. Then we can take whatever we have and find true thanksgiving and joy in it and leverage all of it for your glory. That's the people we want to be. Grant that to us. We ask it in your name. Amen.